This is the Extra Point Podcast from Arizona's family. A Black Monday in the National Football League just about wrapped up. The Arizona Cardinals making probably the biggest headlines today as Cliff Kingsbury no longer the head coach of the Arizona Cardinals. Let's bring in longtime NFL writer, Cardinals beat writer, Howard Balzer to discuss. An Extra Point Hall of Famer, by the way, and an Emmy Award winner. It looks like, is that an Emmy behind you there on the shelf? It is an Emmy, a local one when I was in St. Louis. It's 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 a number of years ago. I have to admit that. But yeah, that was that was kind of cool. I was doing some little one minute, 90 second commentaries for a local TV station and they they put them all together and sent them in and I ended up winning the Emmy. It was pretty cool. All right, let's win you another one. Goals for 2023. Go. Uh, goals for the Arizona Cardinals for 2023. Find a new coach, find a new GM. But first of all, I just want to get your reaction when we found out the news today around, uh, what was that, 10 o'clock local time, Cliff Kingsbury, no longer the head coach of the franchise, what was your reaction? Look, not, not surprising, certainly. Oh, it came a little bit earlier than expected because many of us had been out there for open locker room this morning, which, of course, was open. doesn't mean there was many players in there. But that ended at about 9.15. We were scheduled to meet with Cliff Kingsbury at 2, so a lot of people left. And about a few minutes after I got home, all of a sudden – the news breaks that all of this has happened, which of course we couldn't let be known uh, before the open locker room, but hey, uh, we, we kind of accept that as the way things are. So like I said, not surprised. There was a lot of people wondering, what will Michael Bidwell do? Will he give Cliff Kingsbury another year after one of the most, I don't even know what words to use to describe it anymore, Mark, in terms of all the things that happened to this franchise starting 11 months ago and or whatever it is, you know, in, in, in February, uh, and everything that's happened to them, the mounting injuries week to week, there was almost something else. And I thought it was fitting that in Sunday's game against the 49ers, the Cardinals had so many players injured that were inactive. They actually were, pl- were playing two players short than what they could have because they just didn't have enough players. So you wondered if Cliff Kingsbury would be given a little bit of a pass considering the growth from the last three seasons. But not surprising, especially, Mark, when you look at the history of this franchise going going back, you know, decades where they'll have a coach, he'll make some progress, do some good things, and then has a step back season. And instead of being a little patient with it and seeing if they can rebound from that, nope, you're gone. We're going to start over, reset, and find some new faces to bring into the building. So that's been their pattern. So it shouldn't, so obviously it shouldn't be surprising that uh, Michael Bidwell made this decision. Yeah, and I, and I thought the Thursday night meltdown with, with Kyler yelling at Cliff pretty much sealed his fate that you can't have the quarterback doing that to the head coach. This is about reaching Kyler, in my opinion. What's Who's on your short list that can do that? that, that that's a great question because I've maintained all along and talking to a lot of people today, it's not, not just today, that Kyler Murray is the elephant in the room. And it's not only handling Kyler, it's also – you have to find a coach and a general manager who believe that the style that Kyler Murray plays is sustainable in the NFL. I have my questions whether it is. Lamar Jackson of the Ravens has been out at the end of each of the last two seasons. Murray has now experienced six injuries in four seasons, five of them to his legs. And now who knows when he's going to be able to you know, practice or play again. So you bring in a new offense, he's not even going to be able to really learn it on the field probably until at least October. So there's a com- combination of things here. And I can tell you absolutely that there are coaches who who don't think that they can win with consistently with that style of quarterback. I know there's GMs that wouldn't draft a quarterback like that because of the fear of injury and you're not going to have them. So that becomes to me one of the biggest questions in all of this. And I actually asked Michael Bidwell about that. If, if he wonders about his, this and he says, well, you know, last year um, we were 12 and two. Well, actually it was 10 and two. Uh, and then I answered and said, well, he was healthy then. And he says, yes, and he's going to get healthy now and he's going to be great. Well, okay. I mean, that's easy to say, but the reality is he hasn't been healthy for varying times in these last four seasons. And so that to me, like I said, that, that I think that's going to be a a real subject of discussion with any of the potential GM candidates or head coaches 
that Michael Bidwell interviews. Yeah, and uh, you look at uh, another thing that, that Michael Bidwell said today about he, he doesn't think they're as, they're as broken as they appear with the record. But I look at the offensive line, and I think, yeah, that's that's more than a draft away. Uh, I look at the the defense, and with J.J. Watt leaving and Zach Allen becoming a free agent, uh, you know, I, I, Isaiah Simmons, I'm still looking for him to, to step up and, and become that first-round pick. How How much talent do you feel like is on this team? That's that's a good. I, I think there is a pretty good. You raised some great questions. Don't get me wrong. I think there is a, a pretty good foundation of talent, but obviously there's a lot of work to be done. And the offensive line is crucial. It is absolutely paramount to have an offensive line that not only is good but somehow stays healthy. Because you you people remember the Giants teams that that the one that beat the Patriots, beat the Patriots in the Super Bowl. But the, the one year, they didn't have any Hall of Famers. They didn't, I don't even think they had a pro bowler on their offensive line. But none of them missed games. They played together. They had consistency and continuity. This offensive line didn't really have it at the end of last season, and they obviously didn't have it for most of this year. So that is a huge fix, especially at center, that has to be made. I go back to the Rodney Hudson situation. I thought that was totally mishandled this year in terms of not having a readily apparent backup to him if something would happen. I mean, this team the last two seasons, Mark, I know it's not as simplistic as one guy, but this team is 11-5 and five over the last two seasons when Rodney Hudson plays. And I, be- I believe the number is, is, is something like 4-13 and 13 when he doesn't play. I don't think he's coming back, so they have to find a center. Uh, they have to find a left guard probably. I mean, so there there are a lot of things to do on that on that line, but there's a lot of other things. What will be DeAndre Hopkins' uh, status? You mentioned Zach Allen, potential free agent. Byron Murphy Jr., guy who missed most of the end of the season because of a back injury, unrestricted free agent. So obviously, whoever the GM is and whoever the head coach becomes, there's a lot of work to be done with this team in the off season. What do you think you could get on the trade market for DeAndre Hopkins? It would have would a first round pick. Could he fetch a first round pick? Could he could he fetch more than a first round pick? I, I would think the only way you would get a first round pick would be for a contending team that ha- needs that one receiver in a short window. I mean, how many years does he have left? Maybe two or three. This is this is a guy remember that up until he came to Arizona had missed two games in his entire career. Now, the last two years, he missed a bunch of games last year with injury. He had the suspension at the beginning of this year, and then another injury, a couple of injuries, the hamstring and now the knee that acted up at the end of the year. So I think you could maybe get a one from a team that believes they will be at the end of the round because they're already good, and they and he, and then he might be that missing link. Other than that, you have to look at his contract, uh, how much money is in it. He's going to be 31 next June. And so I don't believe there will be a robust trade market for him. But if the next regime feels, hey, we're, we're resetting a lot of things, it's time to move on, then maybe you take the best uh, that you can get and have his contract go off the books. Yeah, Coach, GM first. I mean, Michael Bidwell said today he'd rather hire a GM first. And your experience from watching how the greatest show on turf was built and maybe even some of those St. Louis Cardinals – teams back I don't, were you there for air Coriel and how that was built and then the neil lomax teams what well, well, how, how would you build a football team and who would you hire to do it I, I was i was there for the lomax year i came in i i, I moved to st louis I, ironically enough the year that don Coriel was fired and that was in one of those situations where they had been great for three seasons had one regression of a season where they were seven five hundred seven and seven and he was fired and of course, Michael Bidwell's father changed the locks on his office uh, when he was fired. That, that that happened right when I moved there, when all that was going on. But be that uh, as it as it may, I think that the GM obviously has to be a strong evaluator of personnel. And I know one one name that intrigues me a lot is a name that was mentioned today as a, as a guy that the Cardinals are interested in is Adam Peters, the, the assistant general manager of the 49ers. And I've talked to some personnel people in the league who have told me that he has been an instrumental part of that 49ers success and the team that they have built, obviously, on the field. So that would be one guy. I'm sure there's a lot of qualified people. The reality is you're going to be getting a guy who's doing it for the first time, probably a coach, too. 
I would doubt the pipe dream for Jim Harbaugh or Sean Payton are going to happen. So you're going to get another Cliff Kingsbury, only in terms of being a head coach for the first time. I think having some NFL experience behind them will be a plus that Kingsbury uh, did not have. But it's the one thing I always say, Mark, just like the draft is a crapshoot, hiring guys is a crapshoot too. They can all impress you in interviews. You know what they've done before with a lot of times quality organizations. But you never know how it's going to be when they're running the show and how will everything play out? Will the picks, you know, will they be coached up? All, all those things, you just never know. You just never know. I had someone tell me the other day, well, look at the Lions. You know, they went outside the organization and got a general manager and a coach and look how they've improved. And I said to the, I said to the person who said that, yeah. And the, the time before that, they did the same thing and they bombed out with Matt Patricia and, and the general manager, Bob Quinn. So you just don't know no matter how much you think you're getting the right guys, you don't know if it's going to work. And the one part of it is it's darn hard to win in the NFL. I don't think the people who are working for teams and coaches, they're not bad. You know, there, there's a lot of quality, smart people, but there's a lot of things that have to go right in terms of building a quality, consistent winning organization. And certainly the Cardinals, Hey, that has not been their history. Cliff Kingsbury, is only the, the 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 eighth player in franchise, the eighth coach in franchise history that has coached four or five seasons. They only have two guys that have coached six, and that was uh, Jim Hannafin and Ken Wisenhunt. That's it in their entire 103 season history. So somehow Michael Bidwell has to figure out a way to get it right. What have you done for me lately? That is, it's the not for long, the, the National what Football League. What have you done for me lately? What have you done for me ever? <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, and, and you look at the Cardinals history and you just say, yeah, it's something. I mean, you look, well, how many coaches did the Steelers had in all their, I mean, three, right. Three since 1969. Right. What's, I mean, and that is, that is the model of consistency you're trying to build. And I remember when the Steelers came in here and it was basically a Steelers home game. Uh, was that the Wilkes year? And, and Michael Bidwell looked around and you could just see the look on his face like, uh, we yeah. got to we got to figure this out. And, and he's trying to figure it out, uh, obviously, with today's news conference. But yeah, it's it's hard to get right. But if I were a betting man, if you were a betting man, would so you're not putting your money on Jim Harbaugh or Sean Payton to come here? I, I am not. I mean, may, maybe that can happen. I mean, any I, I don't I don't dismiss it. I just think it's probably unlikely with Peyton you're going to have to give up draft choices and I'm sure the Saints would demand if it even gets that far they would demand the Cardinals first round pick now some would say no you can't give up the third round you know the third overall pick in the draft here's the reality of the draft that people forget I, I looked at five seasons from night from 2015 for years 2015 to 2019 I look I didn't look at the last three years so I think it's still a little bit early those five years, Mark, there were 15 players drafted, obviously, in the first five picks. Five of the, uh, Only five of them are still with the same team. Wow. To me, when you look at that, you can get a proven winner, a guy like Sean Payton, then you give up one, you know, one high draft pick to get him to help build your team. But I'll go back to what I said about Kyler Murray. Does anybody truly know that if Sean Payton is willing to hitch his wagon to Kyler Murray and that style of quarterback quarterbacking to give him a chance to consistently win? Maybe he is, but there's also a chance that maybe he isn't. And that becomes the thing too. Here's one of the points I make with first time head coaches. What do we know about first time head coaches? This is in most cases, this is their last, this is their only shot at being a head coach. And they also know, looking at the NFL, that if it doesn't if it doesn't happen right away in the first one or two years, then you're going to be on your way. We've seen that quite a bit. I mean, look at the Texans; they 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 fired you know they fired two coaches, the same coach after one year, and one was an experienced guy that they fired last night in Lovey Smith. So, are you going to go to a place with a quarterback that you don't believe is sustainable over time, and you're not going to get a playbook in his hand that he can practice until October? Then are you going to take that job, especially if you're being pursued by other teams? I, you know, that I think that's going to be a factor in how this all uh, play, plays out. And 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 the and the, the, the Murray situation, like I said, not being available probably to practice until at least October. And so, and that's just not play. That's practice. That's practice. 
And so uh, with a new system that everybody on the offense is going to have to learn if it's someone from the outside. So there's so many of these questions. You know, the one thing that has been dangled out there, Mark, the possibility of Vance Joseph being the head coach. And I don't dismiss that as unlikely. I think there's certainly a chance it could happen. And the one potential positive of that is Vance Joseph might, and I say might, look at the young offensive coaches they have on the staff, Cam Turner and Spencer Whipple, who everybody remembers took over the play calling when the Cardinals played the Browns a couple of years ago during COVID when Cliff Kingsbury tested positive, that he could make, perhaps keep those guys and say, hey, let's see what you can do. And, and it creates continuity in the offense where you don't have to spend an entire offense and offseason and training camp learning something new. Again, I'm not predicting that would happen, but it could end up being a interesting way to go. Yeah, and I, and I think the coach next year, whoever it is, is probably going to get a mulligan, and you're probably looking at, yeah. okay, we have the, the draft picks this year. Uh, maybe you get another top five draft pick next year, and that's that's almost the strategy. So do you think – I mean, do you go with a guy like D'Amico Ryans in San Francisco? If you bring in a defensive guy, you got to – I mean, like, you know, circling back to our original point, I think this is about Kyler. Who who gets on the same page with Kyler? And that's – this is tricky. It is. It's totally tricky. And so if you look look at a guy like Ryan who is going to be a head coach, you know, one of these years, whether it's this year or whenever, well, what is the, the first thing that a defensive coach oriented coach has to be able has to do is hire a quality offensive coordinator and sometimes it'll be someone from that staff he's coming from not the coordinator there generally but a quarterback's coach or something like that and the one trend that there's been in the league and michael bidwell said today it doesn't have to be an offensive coach or a defensive coach the as the head coach the trend is for offensive coaches and here's the reason why the main reason why because if your head coach is the guy who implements the offense, well, then when the offense works, even though you have an offensive coordinator in name, but it's really the head coach's offense, if that head coach, if that offensive coordinator gets poached to be a head coach somewhere else, the head coach is still there, assuming you play well. Well, he wouldn't be hired if you weren't playing well. So the head coach is still there to keep that offense going. But if you're a, if you're a defensive coach and you bring in someone new as a coordinator and it works and it's playing well, well, that guy's being hired somewhere else. And then what do you have? Then what do you do? Do you, do you hire from your own staff? Do you hire someone from the outside that then brings in something new? I think that, that's why the trend has been almost 70 to 80% of the head coaches over the last five, six years have been offensive oriented. And I think a, the offensive orientation of the game today and what a passing league it is, is part of it, but it's also because those nuances in the coaching staff, that you have to deal with if your offensive coordinator leaves and you have to find somebody new. Yeah, and I'm I'm preparing for a dark couple of years. I don't I don't mean to be negative and I certainly wish everybody well and I realize it's there's a lot of good people in the building over there and I just think it's this is this is going to take a while. How do you feel about the, the the forecast here? Well, you know, you will obviously depend on when Kyler Murray is healthy and you're 100% right about a pass for the first season most likely. And doctors, you know, doc, pay attention to NFL insiders most of the time because a lot of time they're getting information from agents. I've talked to doctors about Kyler Murray, and in some ways the torn meniscus he had is almost as problematical as the, as the ACL from this standpoint is it delays your rehab because you have to be braced, you have to be on a boot, those things. So it could delay a certain portion of the rehab. And so, but even if it's nine months, like everybody's predicting, that's October. That's October, and that's before you get on the field. But others have said to me, that's with a, rate, a you know, a, a pocket quarterback who doesn't need his legs as much. Kyler Murray needs his legs to be effective, and he Kyler might not be Kyler until November first. So that that's half the season. Then obviously you hope that he continues uh, to stay healthy. But so he's a big part of any improvement this team, you know, m- might have. But you're it could it could take a while. If you, if you hit a lot of, you know, hit a lot of things on that offense and, you know, get, you know, get a pretty good line together, you can at least be competitive. The one thing I do look at is this, Mark, and I give Cliff Kingsbury and the coaching staff a tremendous amount of credit with all the things that happened this year, with the attrition in the roster. I mean, Sunday they were playing 15 backups as starters, 15 
backups. And yet, yesterday's game in the second half obviously wasn't competitive. That's one of the best teams in the league. Most of the games this year, they were still competitive. They lost six one-score games. They lost two games, obviously, on, in the last second uh, to the, by one point to the Chargers and, um, and Atlanta. Overtime loss to Phil, uh, to Tampa Bay. Three-point loss earlier in the, in the year to the Eagles. So with everything happened, they were still competitive. So I think that, that's what you hope for for next year. And one other reality, the nature of the NFL is how much difference really is there? I know 4-13 and 13 is horrible. It's the optics. It sounds horrible. But how much difference is there between winning four games and winning eight games? Not that much difference, really, in the NFL. That's the nature of a short schedule. If this team had managed to go you know, seven and 10 or eight and nine, the whole feeling about it would be different if they had won some of those close games, given everything that happened to them. But you win only four, and that's, that's just a terrible look. And so it's not out of the question that, that they, they could still – you know, win more games next year, even with, you know, a roster that needs needs a bit of help. But I think there still is, especially on defense, a good core of younger players. But there, there is, a like you said earlier, there's a lot of work that needs to be done on that offense. Trace McSorley or Colt McCoy starting at quarterback for the Cardinals on opening day next year? I would think it should be Colt McCoy. Now, that, that depends on what the coach, you know, what they believe. But I don't think there's any doubt that a healthy Colt McCoy gives you a better chance to win some games than, and I like what Trace McSorley showed. I like a little bit what David Blau uh, showed, but you, you definitely have a better chance to win games with Colt McCoy. And even though, like you said, you're given a pass, the coach will be given somewhat of a pass next year. You certainly don't want to just, you know, say, well, we don't, we don't care what the record is. And so I, I, I think it should be McCoy or, or at least someone else experienced. What does the new coach think of Colt McCoy? Maybe there's another quarterback out there that would come in instead. Who knows? He's going to be a backup somewhere, but will have a chance to play earlier in the season. But hey, McCoy showed in, in games that he started that he could help the team win games, and so I think he he would he would should be the choice to start the year. But hey, like I said, that's up to the new coach. Yeah, and I wonder with the concussions too if he's looking at that and and thinking that, yeah, about that's his a, future. That's and, a big I, I, I would I would certainly be, and he's had a heck of a career. And if you're not going to, uh, you know, be playing, I mean, it depends what the team looks like next year, but it certainly doesn't seem like it's going to be uh, a Super Bowl contender. And if you're kind of uh, on the back nine, maybe you think about hanging them up. But that's his decision to make. All right, last question for you, and we appreciate your time here. Um, is Cliff Kingsbury going to come back here with the Rams next year and be in the sidelines with Sean McVay and just be beating his chest as the Rams come back, come in here and continue to win games? It's amazing you asked me that because I said it to my wife the other day. You know, it's, you know what we're going to be laughing at? Now, that's of course, depends on Sean McVay coming back, how much all these rumors are true. But I said, wouldn't that – because I, I, they're losing, and they, they don't really have you – know, they, they're one of those teams that has that offensive coordinator in name only, right? But uh, that, that guy, Leanne Cohen, I believe, is supposedly leaving for Kentucky, which you wonder, well, why would you leave an NFL staff to go to college? But, yeah, that would not surprise me at all. We know they're close. Sometimes it's not the greatest idea to bring in a, a quote, friend of that uh, to your coaching staff. But, man, I, I, I could definitely see Kingsbury going in there and when maybe doesn't call the plays, but you, you know that McVay would probably uh, trust him. And that, that, that would say a lot because the interesting thing is, as bad as this season was, the Rams won one more game than the Cardinals. But you look at some of the offensive numbers, they were worse. They were worse than the Cardinals in a lot of ways, which shows what can happen when you have a myriad of different offensive line combinations. You lose players here, there, and everywhere. And those are the things that happen even to a team that was in the Super Bowl and won the Super Bowl last year with a guy that's considered one of the best coaches in the NFL. We see the Titans. Cardinal fans would probably love to have that quote alpha male, that hard nosed guy like Mike Vrabel. But what did they do when injuries hit them in the second half of the season? They lost seven in a row and fell out of clear control of the AFC South and aren't even in the postseason. Those are the things that happen to teams. And the Cardinals were not alone in that. I get the sense sometimes that, you know, people have a very narrow view of things and think that, oh, this is oh, this is the worst in the world. This is pathetic. This is that. But 
there, there, there's other teams that are both uh, to the card. All right, where can we read your stuff? Where can we find your stuff? And where can we follow you as the Super Bowl gets ready to come to town? Looking forward to that. Go PHNX. Uh, dot com. I've got a story that'll 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 be up uh, on this whole pattern of uh, the way coaching coaching hires work uh, with the Cardinals franchise. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at hbalzer b a l z e r seven twenty one, and so and hear me here, there, and everywhere on different radio stations around the valley. The Emmy Award winning Howard Balzer making a return trip into the extra point here. Thanks for your time. My pleasure, always, Mark. Take care. The Extra Point Podcast is a production of 3TV, CBS5, and azfamily.com in Phoenix, Arizona.